Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I am so excited uh, to uh, be able to join you all in uh, Australia. Uh, I wish I could be there in person uh, to, uh, to meet uh, all wonderful people. Uh, we're gonna be, uh, so I have been asked uh, to speak about orthostatic tremor and uh, what we're doing here at the University of Nebraska and uh, we're very excited uh, to be here and to be able to share uh, some of what we do uh, with you all. Um, the, the main topic that I'm going to discuss with, uh, with you today is what, is what causes orthostatic tremor? What is behind the disease? What is driving the disease? Um, so my name is Diego Torres Rosoto. I am uh, associate professor and chief of the Movement Disorder uh, Division here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, I am also the director of the Movement Disorders uh, Fellowship Program and director for uh, students' clinical neurology education. And uh, orthostatic tremor is uh, my main area of uh, research uh, interests uh, for sure. Um, so the spoiler alert is that in terms of that question, what causes OT, the final and real answer right now is that we do not know yet, but we're working on it. And uh, what I want is to, um, to have a, a trip, ha have a vacation with you all, have a trip through the way scientists think about diseases and how diseases uh, affect uh, human beings and how we learn about what causes a particular disease. So I'm gonna take you uh, through that journey uh, because that is the journey that we together need to uh, have in order to understand what is causing uh, OT. So, the question is, do we really know what orthostatic tremor is? What kind of disease is it? What's wrong in the body? Is there a part of the brain or, or the body that is not working? How do patients get it? Um, there are many, uh, many questions that we don't know about OT. So how scientists find out the cause of an illness? Well, this is the list of, of the ways that we, that we answer the question as to the etiology of a disease. Uh, it we could be through opinion from experts. Um, it could be uh, by using historical data analysis, by using family history, by association with other diseases, by the response to drugs, uh, of uh, patients with a particular condition or by performing especially designed experiments. And this list is particularly placed in order of importance of or usefulness in terms of, you know, uh, how do we define uh, the diseases and the conditions. Uh, and we're going to go through each of those in order uh, together. So let's start by expert opinion. If we use expert opinion, what we do is we say, okay, so who's an expert on OT? What do they know? What has been their experience in the clinic? And uh, then based on that, we can gather some conclusions about the disease. And uh, you're gonna notice that that is really the least, um, uh, the, the, the smallest of all of the options, it, it is the one that has the biggest amount of limitations because the experts, uh, to be able to collect their opinion, uh, you know, the best way of doing that is through uh, standardized methodologies of the scientific method. So by just listening to my opinion, uh, yes, I have seen more than 100 patients with orthostatic tremor, because of what we do here. If you just listen to my opinion, that is really not the best way of figuring things out. You have to go through proper scientific methodology. But let's, let's see what happens when, you know, when we look at experts. And uh, 
here in the United States, the very first description of, uh, of American cases of orthostatic tremor was made by Dr. Hellman, um, who basically coined the name orthostatic tremor. And uh, he said that it was a sporadic rare disorder that happens only while standing. And he said that it was responsive to clonazepam. Uh, however, the very first time that, that orthostatic tremor was described was not here in the United States, but it was in Italy at the University of Bologna. And uh, that's a picture there. That's the oldest uh, medical school in the world. And uh, this is the, the first page of the paper that is called on a, on an unusual disorder of erect standing, presentation of three cases. And these were doctors Pazzaglia, Sabatini, and Lugaresi who made this uh, discovery of this disease, orthostatic tremor, and that was done in 1970. Um, and they said this, in January of 1968, we observed a patient who was unable to maintain the standing posture due to the insurgence of hyperkinesias that compromised the equilibrium. So there is a lot of information there. Um, but so what do we know so far from these experts, the ones that actually described the disease at the beginning? Well, just, just based on opinion, we know that it is a rare disorder. Um, we know that the, the tremor might be producing the instability. That's what the Italians uh, said. And, uh, and that it seems to respond to clonazepam. Now, if we use historical data analysis, meaning you grab all of the patient charts that you have and you start looking at the data, then you might understand the disease in a completely different way. Um, so here we have um, a, a review of the three of the largest series of patients from Mayo Clinic, from uh, Queen Square uh, and uh, Europe, and from Columbia University uh, here in the United States. And as you can see, they were able to collect a total of 97 patients. 70% um, of the patients were females, and they had an earlier onset that, than male patients. The mean age at onset of disease was on the sixth decade, so meaning on, uh, on when patients were in their 50s. And the youngest age of onset was on the fourth decade on this particular case series. The oldest was on the ninth decade, meaning on when the patient was in his or her 80s. So that's a lot more information uh, when you actually go back and look at historical data. So what we know now is that OT is a rare non-genetic disorder with female predominance occurring in patients older than 30, and it responds to clonazepam. So you see how the way we describe the disease has changed, and it will continue to evolve as we continue to get more and more data. That's the importance of research. Um, we went ahead, Dr. Danish Pahati and, uh, and uh, myself, we did a review of each and all of the cases reported in the literature until November of 2015. And it was about 300 articles uh, presenting 434 cases of orthostatic tremor published in the, liter in the literature in English. And uh, after all of that review, we actually gather a lot of important information. Um, is OT a disease of the middle uh, age? Yeah, the mean age of onset was 56.3. But the youngest age of onset reported was age seven. So what that means now is that the disease can have an onset between ages seven to age 87. That's the oldest age of onset reported in the literature. And again, we had about two uh, women for each male um, with orthostatic tremor just based on, on these publications. 
Therefore, there, there seems to be significant variability of age of onset, um, which means that then exposure to, for example, a toxin might not be it. This is not an accumulation of a toxin that is inducing the disease. Uh, so maybe it is a combination of genetic predisposition and environmental exposures because if you get something so young as age seven, you know, it probably cannot be explained by just environmental factors. There might be some genetic predisposition. So this uh, has changed the way we think about the condition. How often do orthostatic pa uh, tremor patients fall? 74% of the patients denied falls. And another 14% reported rare falls. So basically 90% of patients with orthostatic tremor either don't fall or they fall rarely. Um, is orthostatic tremor a progressive disease? The majority of cases reported some progression, about 80% of the cases reported some progression over time. What is the, co the most common frequency of the tremor? You know, the, uh, as a shaking in the legs, we could measure the shaking and know how many times the leg moves back and forth, and we call that a frequency. And the uh, mean OT frequency uh, was 15 hertz. In fact, 70% of cases were between 14 and 16. Um, uh, were there other tremors associated with orthostatic tremor? The answer was yes. 35% uh, of patients had some tremors, and the most common one was a slow postural hand tremor that occurred. You know, out of that 35%, two thirds of the patients had that. Um, so the previous uh, orthostatic tremor diagnostic criteria uh, say that it is a discrete idiopathic, meaning that it has no known uh, etiology, clinical entity with subjective feeling of unsteadiness during stance, but only in severe cases during gait. And they say that there is no problems while sitting or lying down. Uh, sparse clinical findings, meaning that the patients look normal otherwise, except for fine amplitude leg tremor. And then they say that the diagnosis is confirmed through EMG. Uh, the patients rarely fall. Sometimes tremor is only palpable. And then uh, the legs, the trunks, the upper extremities can have the same tremor uh, found on EMG. So that's what they said. How about syndromic associations? Um, you know, if you, if you think about it, if a disease, a, a, a particular condition, say OT, always presents with a particular set of diseases or conditions, um, then that association could help us know what's wrong with the patients. Say, for example, every OT patient would have a neuropathy, then we know, oh, then it is that damage of the nerves in the legs that might be inducing the orthostatic tremor, okay? So this is a list of conditions that have been associated with OT in the past. And as you can see, we have, uh, you know, Parkinsonism in, in about uh, 10 to 15% of the cases. Uh, we have uh, restless leg syndrome in, in uh, some patients cerebellar degeneration, and, and, and many, many, many other conditions. So when you have so many conditions that have been associated with a disease, then you don't know if these associations are real or if it's just, you know, by chance that the patients are having all of these other conditions associated with the orthostatic tremor. What do we know about the prognosis uh, based on literature review? Well, 15% of patients felt the severity of the symptoms uh, really worsen over time. Uh, in the other literature that we review, it was the majority of patients felt that there was some slow progression, but it wasn't clear and it wasn't severe. Um, less than 10% of patients used walking aids around 10% of patients had a clear spread of the tremor to other parts. And uh, objective prospective data from our study is pending, but 
that's one of the questions that we're trying to answer. Um, now, so if we get together all of the historical data review, what we have so far is that OT is a rare underdiagnosed disorder with female predominance occurring in patients of all ages, although predominant during adulthood, tremor is universally present, and although the main symptom is unsteadiness, most patients do not fall or rarely fall. It seems to be slowly progressive in most patients, and it can be associated with many neurological illnesses, and therefore it is unclear if that association is real or not. Well, how about reviewing family history? Um, you know, by doing that, we can gather information as to whether the disease is genetic in nature or not. And uh, we have, on, on patients with OT, we know that uh, they have a family history of Parkinson's disease, a family history of tremors, family history of essential tremor, uh, and other types of tremors as well. Um, the data from our study is still pending, um, and uh, we hope that we will be able to answer that information better. In terms of occurrence in families, it is rarely reported as a, fami as a familial disease, but it happens. And uh, there are few twins and one set of triplets that were reported as all of them having the illness. So it seems clear that the condition might happen in families and therefore, it seems unlikely that um, it, it is unclear if OT is a familial disease or not, but definitely it can happen in some families. Um, it seems unlikely that for most patients that they would pass along the disease to their kids and grandkids, but of course we need a lot more information to come. Uh, we discussed the association with other illnesses or signs, and uh, um, how do we know how do we know if there is an association or not? It really depends on the performance of a comprehensive history taking and a comprehensive examination. This has to be done in a standardized fashion, meaning every patient gets the same thing and performed by experts to increase its accuracy. And it should be monitored, observed over time to ensure that those relationships are real uh, and, and uh, uh, to show the severity and the relationship with the severity of the main disease that is being studied. So we started um, our study in 2010. Uh, we have had three major um, uh, study visits, 2012, 2014, and 2017. And therefore, we have been looking at patients over uh, a relatively long period of time. Um, <clears throat> between 2012 and 2014, we, uh, we had a very important finding. We noticed that uh, all of the patients um, that were coming had some level of ataxia and none of the uh, sp spousal controls. Ataxia is a funny word that we movement experts use to basically call uh, clumsiness. And uh, we were able to find on the ataxia study that it was universal. Every patient with OT had some level of ataxia. However, most patients had a very mild level of ataxia. What this, what this means is that it is likely that the cerebellum, which is a part of the brain in the back of the head, the cerebellum and its pathways uh, might be abnormal in orthostatic tremor because when you have diseases of the cerebellum, then you can have ataxia. Um, we also perform the very first psychiatric screening for patients with orthostatic tremor to understand how the, the, the disease was affecting our patients 
at a behavioral level. And uh, we use the MINI International Neuropsychiatric Interview, which is a validated uh, interview to assess, uh, basically screen for psychiatric uh, conditions. And uh, we uh, did that on 29 patients, and 45% of them screen positive for any psychiatric condition. Uh, out of those, 38% uh, uh, screen positive for anxiety, and 7% uh, screen positive for an ongoing depression. Out of those that had anxiety, uh, 11 patients, so all of them, 38% of them, screen positive for what is called agoraphobia. And agoraphobia is a type of phobia of open spaces. It's, an, it's a phobia of, of leaving the house, basically, and uh, being outside in the environment. Uh, two patients had uh, panic disorders. Uh, one had social phobia and one had generalized anxiety disorder. So all of those uh, encompass the 38% of the patients that were positive for any anxiety disorder. That is a very high level of anxiety uh, and definitely higher than in the general population. So the conclusions from the OT psychiatric survey is that a large proportion of OT patients were screen positive for anxiety disorders. And this highlights the importance to, to know if the patients have abnormal balance or maybe they have a, uh, what is called a basiphobia, which is a phobia against uh, standing. Um, the next level on trying to understand a disease is to review the response to medications and substances. Each part of the brain, each system within the brain, responds to drugs in a different fashion. So some parts of the brain respond to certain type of medications and some other parts of the brain respond to others. So by understanding how this disease would respond to certain medications, we could tell what parts of the brain might be affected. And uh, what we know so far is that most patients have at least a partial response to clonazepam and gabapentin. These two are anti-epileptic drugs that tend to decrease the uh, activity of, of the brain, of the cortex of the brain overall. Um, we also know that some patients with OT see improvement after alcohol consumption. It's about a third of the patients notice that. And uh, we don't have enough data from our study to answer this particular question yet. But by, uh, by the analysis that we have been able to provide you so far, OT seems to improve by providing inhibitory drugs to the brain. And therefore, OT brains might be functioning at an abnormally high level of arousal, which could also be seen on patients that have anxiety disorders. So all of this uh, starts to, um, to get together uh, in a nice uh, fashion. Now, the best way of answering questions about a disease is by especially designing experiments and evaluations following the scientific method. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to give you some examples of what we have been doing uh, here at the University of Nebraska in orthostatic tremor. Uh, the last meeting we had was uh, in September 2017. September is OT month, and uh, I'm very proud. Uh, um, I'm very proud of that. Um, it was a, a great idea, and one of the main uh, uh, persons to push uh, this uh, this uh, thought of uh, of uh, September September being the OT month was from Australia. So you all should be very proud. Uh, we uh, try to celebrate uh, the OT month by either publishing a paper 
uh, on that month uh, or performing uh, the research meetings and the research uh, studies uh, on that timing. Um, on this last uh, meeting in 2017, we decided to perform a structural and functional imaging to evaluate the anatomy of the brain and the function of the brain of orthostatic tremor patients. We also perform a study called video nystagmography to evaluate the relationship between vision and vestibular and balance systems. We uh, perform biomechanics gate lab testing to evaluate balance in, and walking in a formal objective fashion. We also perform electromyography with virtual reality to evaluate how visual input can change the tremor. We perform transcranial magnetic stimulation to see how orthostatic tremor brain works and reacts to stimuli. We perform optical coherence tomography to see if there is eye or brain tissue loss. So in conclusion, uh, so far, what, what, what we have been able to gather uh, with this conversation today, uh, so far, is that OT is a rare underdiagnosed disorder with female predominance occurring in patients of all ages, although predominant during adulthood. Tremor and ataxia are universally present and the cerebellum and its pathways might be abnormal. Although the main symptom is unsteadiness, most patients do not fall or they rarely fall. It seems to be slowly progressive. It can be associated with many neurological illnesses, although it is unclear if these are related to OT or not at this point. It is unlikely to be a familial disease for most people. It is unlikely, therefore, for patients to pass along the disease to the younger the generations. However, it is possible that some OT patients have the illness due in part to genetic abnormalities. OT brains might be functioning at a higher level of arousal than normal and anxiety disorders are common among patients with OT. There is still a lot that we don't know about orthostatic tremor, but uh, we are truly committed to, uh, to this condition as many other scientists around the world. Uh, At this point, I would like to make, um, uh, to give you an update of, uh, of one area of uh, OT study that we are having uh, within the University of Nebraska. One way of thinking about the condition. Uh, we have more than 30 different uh, studies that we're performing right now in, at the University of Nebraska in orthostatic tremor. But I'm going to give you some updates of what are we doing and, 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 a, and a review of one of these areas, one of these ways of thinking about the disease. So one of the main, uh, I'm gonna review some of the projects that we have completed. Uh, one of them was the orthostatic tremor app. We wanted to test and see if it was necessary to perform EMG or if we could use an app that measured tremor and if that would be enough. And the answer to that was that by placing an uh, iPhone with an app that measures tremor uh, on the patient's knees when they were standing, we were able to see the peaks of uh, the, the high tremor frequency and therefore uh, be able to make a diagnosis of, of uh, uh, high tremor frequency that way. Um, we also have completed the orthostatic tremor screening questionnaire, uh, which is a questionnaire that patients fill out and is highly sensitive for the disease. We have completed the OT psych study that you already have seen some results of. 
We also have performed a video magnification uh, study that we presented um, in uh, Germany at the annual uh, movement disorder meeting. Uh, we have completed the uh, study that proved that ataxia was uh, present in most patients, although it was present at a very low, mild level. Uh, we perform a study to see uh, how at balance scales looked on patients with ataxia, and we had blinded uh, physical therapists performing uh, these uh, assessments, and uh, the results were very significant, and uh, uh, the patients with orthostatic tremor had definitely abnormal balance scales. We also perform a study of electroencephalography on patients with OT. It is the largest o uh, EEG study done in OT patients, and it is about to be published. Uh, we still have many, many remaining questions in OT. Do we really know what is orthostatic tremor? How to diagnose it and uh, its clinical characteristics? Why OT patients fall less than other balanced patients? I think this is a critical question. Where in the brain the tremor comes from? What we call the oscillator. Are there neighboring signs of dysfunction that can predict where this oscillator might be? Uh, can OT teach us how to prevent falls in other disorders of balance? That's a great question. And we have many more. I'm listing uh, here some of them and, and even some more. But I'm going to review one thought with you. Um, since patients rarely fall, but they always feel unsteady when they are standing. In fact, most of my patients tell me that when they are standing, they feel a sensation of impending falling. And if they don't do something, they will fall. That's, what, that's how they feel. And that's how the disease presents. However, the patients rarely fall. So are patients truly unsteady or do they just feel unsteady? I think that's a critical question that we need to answer in OT. Um, if they are unsteady, they are truly unsteady, then how come they are not falling? That's one question. If they are unsteady and they are not falling, it means that they are activating maneuvers that are helping them avoid the falls. And therefore, we could learn how to use those for other conditions that where patients have imbalance and they fall all the time. Now, if they are truly unsteady, then how come unsteadiness can cause tremor or be related to tremor? And is this the same tremor as when someone is scared or not? And there are many questions below that. Now, if they just feel unsteady, meaning that their balance is actually normal, and that's why they do not fall, but they just feel unsteady, and this feeling is really strong, so then what's the localization in the brain of this sensation of unsteadiness? Is this a phobia of stance? So in terms of future directions, um, you know, in regards to the etiology, uh, we need to think in, in, in many different ways. Uh, you know, one, one question is how does unsteadiness while standing differs from a sensation of unsteadiness in terms of localization in the brain, physiology, etiology, and so on and so forth. Do the patients have a balance problem? or do they have a sensation of imbalance problem? What objective tests can we use to differentiate true imbalance from a subjective sensation of imbalance? 
is uh, OT related to basophobia, which is a phobia of standing. So we have a number of ongoing projects to answer that question. Uh, we have in the biomechanics lab uh, uh, an evaluation that will render objective information on balance status. Uh, this has been done in the past, but not in the way we did it here. Uh, we had many, many patients undergo the testing. Uh, it's probably going to end up being the largest biomechanic lab uh, study in OT. Um, we have used virtual reality to help evaluate the effects of a sensation of imbalance in patients and in controls. We have performed a Delphi OT project that will help separate tests that are sensitive to fear from tests that are sensitive to unsteadiness and falling. We also uh, have uh, taken uh, measurements of the so-called ABC scale, which it will be testing the fear of falling in a separate fashion. Now, why do we need to be focusing on this? I, I have, you know, uh, many thoughts to this regard. Uh, one of them is that really um, fear of heights and fears overall are very different from one person to the other, okay? Some people are fearful of heights, and that includes me. Uh, and some people are not. Um, you know, some people sort of feel relaxed or, or they just don't feel anything, you know, when they are up high. Um, some people really enjoy it. They feel it's exciting. And uh, therefore, the conclusion here is that the presence of a threat, the threat is falling, okay? The presence of a threat is not the same as the state anxiety level, at the level of anxiety that people are having. <clears throat> in fact, in these two pictures, you can see that very easily. On the left side, this threat of falling is very enjoyable to the people. And on the right side, you see that that threat of falling is definitely not a pleasant experience. Threats do not induce a single stereotype stress response. But we do know that the stress response is directly related to postural control and to ambulation. That is a very well-known fact. So, a large proportion of OT patients screen positive for anxiety disorders. And this can be read in two different ways. One is, if you're always thinking that you're going to fall when you're standing because of OT, then sure, you would be a more anxious person than a normal individual. So one way of thinking about this is that OT is causing anxiety on our patients. Another way of thinking about it would be that OT is also related to this excessive anxiety and maybe partially caused or worsened by this anxiety. So the next challenge is to find a test of balance that is not affected by the fear of falling. And we're performing a number of studies to this regard. Um, this was the OT balance uh, study, and uh, those are that's the list of all of the tests that we perform, all of the balance scales that we perform. And uh, here it's hard to see, but most of the scales were actually abnormal on the patients with orthostatic tremor in comparison with the normal controls. So conclusion from these balance scales is that they are abnormal in OT. But then we encounter this problem is that current scales seem unable to differentiate between fear of falling and true imbalance. And therefore we have developed a number of studies to try to answer, try to divide this, this situation, try to dissect this 
in a better fashion so that we can understand it better. So these are all of the studies that we have completed at the University of Nebraska so far. And this is the list of ongoing uh, studies that we are working on uh, right now. Um, the list is long, and this is a partial list of all that we're doing. But I wanted to uh, finish my presentation by uh, giving uh, you all a, a feel, a feeling of reassurance on the fact that many scientists, many scientists are dedicated to trying to figure this out. Uh, here at the University of Nebraska, our team includes about 100 scientists that are working on trying to figure out orthostatic tremor. And we are here in Nebraska, a small piece of everything that is being done across the world to try to figure out this condition. I wanna uh, thank you again for your uh, invitation, your kind invitation. And uh, I really hope that in the future, I will be able to uh, go to Australia and uh, be present in one of your meetings. And um, I want to finish by um, telling you that uh, I am more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. So please uh, give your questions to the organizers of the meeting and they will uh, be sending that to me so that I can answer your questions. Uh, well, with that, I will uh, finish my presentation and I thank you very much for your attention. You have a great day.